Let me read a gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 15. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, let yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. May we hear in it a word that is to us and for us on this very special day. First, a word of gratitude to Brent, to the lay leaders of this congregation, to everyone who has offered the invitation or accepted the invitation to participate in this open and affirming covenant. I offer this word of thanks because, to put it simply, God doesn't speak to me. Now, given my vocation, I hope that doesn't startle you <laughs> or disappoint you or prompt an emergency meeting of the church council. <laughs> I don't mean to say there are never inklings of a voice within me and beyond me trying to get some message through. I'm just saying that God doesn't speak to me with the kind of clarity that would allow me to announce to the world, God said, fill in the blank. So I am left to learn lessons about love and tenacity and perseverance and vulnerability through human vessels, like those of you who led this congregation to this place. For me, it is people like you who speak divine truth, which I can hear and understand. So thank you. Yet even as I'm thanking you, I owe some of you an apology. Regards this gospel lesson, I read it just three weeks ago. Now, if you were here and you don't remember that I read it, <laughs> or what I said about it, then perhaps you owe me an apology, but we'll circle back to that one later. I, I know that some of you have generous hearts, so you might be inclined to give me the benefit of the doubt. You might be thinking, Phil must have sifted some new insight out of this passage. <laughs> Probably a profound one. That's got to be the explanation for his lack of originality on such a big day in our church. Well, if you're such a person, I want to thank you for believing in me while I also admit that I don't have any new insight. Nothing new has been sifted, profound, or otherwise. But my dilemma was that my heart and mind just kept coming back to this passage. And with incredibly less detail uh, than I did last time, let me just run through how I see it. It presents an unsettling image of Jesus, almost a disturbing image. A woman comes to, to Jesus and, uh, because in the, in the words of the text, she is tormented by a demon. Now, most of us progressives have a hard time getting our heads around this idea of demon possession. It just conjures up these strange ideas. But most of us, or at least many of us, know all too well the longing to have our children's pain come to an end. 
In response to a request, Jesus was at first silent. And then the disciples were so disturbed by this woman, found her to be such a nuisance that they wanted to send her away. And then Jesus insulted her while telling her that he didn't understand his mission to include the Gentiles, a category which included her and her sick daughter. Now, fast forwarding, the woman persisted. She was going to be seen, and she was going to be heard. Before her persistence was exhausted, something in Jesus' heart and mind changed. He healed her daughter. And as we follow Matthew's gospel forward, we find that immediately there was a change. And that the crowds which ingested the teachings of Jesus and received the healing alms of Jesus, the crowd was newly diverse, including Jews and Gentiles, country persons and foreigners. More of the children had made their way to the table. So can you see why my thoughts just kept coming Back, like in the song that Brent couldn't get out of his head. These words, this moment in the gospel story kept coming back to me as the movement of Jesus re was reborn. Becoming radically inclusive. The circle becoming wider and more permeable. And wall after wall beginning to crumble. In this snapshot, Jesus begins as one thing. And then he becomes another. We celebrate today because here at the Congregational Church at Pinehurst, we once were one thing, and now we are another. No, I know, knowing you as I do, that even though I wasn't here when that process took place, I know that before it did, you were good people and welcoming people and kind people and brave people. But a moment, nevertheless, came in your journey as a faith community. And I don't know in what form your persistent mother or hurting child appeared. I'm left only to imagine what altered your sense of mission and ministry. But here's how I imagine it. I imagine that you came to know that any invitation which included even a hint of clenched teeth tolerance, no, that was an insufficient invite. And that only an invite that celebrated all the fullness of humanity would do. I imagine that you came to know that the voice which announced that invitation could not come in the form of a whisper, but it must have been clear and bold and loud when you said, come one, come all. All of this required courage, but I am mindful that it requires courage of every LGBTQ plus person who ever has or will walk through those doors and accept that invitation. Because for every such person, there has been a moment for them when they have accepted just such an invitation, only to, to discover that all are welcome means, well, most are welcome. And when pressed a little bit further, all are welcome in some places means we didn't know you meant that. We sure didn't know you wanted to talk about it. So thank you for the courage of walking through those doors and giving us a chance. As you know, tomorrow we'll mark, we'll mark another anniversary. 22 years ago, we watched in horror as terrorists attacked our nation. The visuals of that day continue to haunt. They serve as reminders of some inescapable truths that call all of us as human beings into accountability. Reminders that hatred begets and nurtures hatred. Anger begets and fuels more anger. Violence begets violence and the cycle repeats itself with a sickening certainty. Tomorrow we'll find ways to consider the varied meanings of that day, but for today, we are, for today we're celebrating another set of inescapable truths. That love begets love. And that is as certain as the rising and the setting of the sun.
that the celebration of all that another person is begets the celebration of all that we are. That's a cycle, too. And that laughing and joyous wonder at human life and all of its beautiful incarnations begets more celebration of human life in all of its beautiful incarnations. There is a reading I use each year during Pride Month, and uh, since I didn't, wasn't very original in my scripture lesson, I won't read that again. <laughs> I will, however, read a small portion of it. It keeps before us the reminder that what was accomplished 10 years ago was not the arrival at a destination as much it was the beginning of an all-filled journey. It's a journey which allows us on occasion to look back over our shoulder and with thanksgiving say, we once for one thing, but now we are another. Let me read it. I will not speak of tolerance with its courteous, clenched teeth. or bitter resignation. We are allied with nothing but love. Within which all the different, differing, gorgeously variant, beautifully deviant aspects of ourselves are bound in elegant unity. I know that on some sad and disappointing days these words describe the church that yet shall be, and not the church that is. I know, I know. But I know that to be on this path is an act of creation, it is a privilege, a prophetic imperative, it is a joy, and it is a holy sacrament. In my reading this past week, I came across a question, and I'll close with this. The question struck me differently than most questions strike me. What was different about it is that in most theological or philosophical questions, I don't know the answer, but I knew the answer to this one. The question was this. What is the story that you are working on that doesn't have an ending yet? I know the answer to that one, at least for today. It is this. The story that we are celebrating, the story that we are continuing to tell. For I know that as we walk hand in hand into our future and continue to tell this story, there will be times when we will laugh and there will be times when we cry tears of joy because we will know with certainty that we once were one thing and it was good. But every day, love will be making of us another. Amen.